Hi guys, welcome to Hilltop Farm. Uh, today is the third and final instalment in our three part uh, special on canning. Um, glad you could join us and we shall get straight into it and carry on where we left off. Okay, so we shall move on to the equipment now. Alright, so first thing you're going to want to get now I know Big W and Kmart sell this so you might be lucky and get one there it's called the Blue Canning Guide to Preserving alright now this is an older one okay Ball Canning <laughs> canning. Ball Mason bring out one of these every year and it's different so the one that's in the in the department stores now will not be this one so don't be looking for that one specifically but it's always called the blue book and it's not blue so but in the blue book it covers everything learning about canning the acidities uh, the acid levels of the, the things that are in them uh, and how that determines uh, how, how things are preserved. Um, there's recipes in here, uh, jams, jellies, chutneys, pickles, how to do meats, seafoods and vegetables. There's low sugar and low salt recipes. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, it also, interestingly enough, has got a chapter on freezing and dehydrating. Um, dehydrating, we've got a couple of dehydrators here and we do dehydrate some of our um, produce, but that's a whole other video so we'll worry about that at a different time. But in here you need to be able to consult uh, your ball canning book because firstly you have to know what altitude you are at above, like how, how many feet you are above sea level. Um, because my first thought was how the hell do I know but it's actually easy if you go on um, the internet and you google it you'll be able to work it out there are maps you know um, that you can click on well, virtually your house and it will tell you you know how far you are above sea level because that has uh, it makes a difference how far you are above sea level um, as to how long things get processed for and what weight goes on the venting uh, valve on the canner. So you do need to know that. And everything is, is different. Okay. Um, if, if you're canning... Um, if you're canning sort of a, one type of vegetable might be different to another be different to meat, be different to jam, be different to something else. Um, bottom line is, I know uh, when things are a, a liquid, something like, for example, you had a thick pumpkin soup, I know that takes a very long time because the viscosity, it takes, takes a long time for the contents in the middle to reach the desired temperature. The idea of pressure canning it's not only to, to seal it in from the outside air, but it raises the temperature to such an extreme that all your nasty bacteria um, are killed. There are different methods of doing it. There's what you, you can, there is a method where you can put um, raw chicken, you can fill up your jar with raw chicken and can it. But to do that, the chicken right in the middle has to reach the desired temperature that's going to kill off you know salmonella and botulism and all these other hideous things that grow in our food um, so of course the, the length of time that's going to have to be canned for is, is going to be longer than for example a chicken stock because chicken stock is liquid and it's already cooked when it goes in. Um, so, and obviously, 
A quart jar is going to take longer than a half pint jar. So all these things have to be taken into consideration. If you've made a spaghetti bolognese sauce that you're canning, okay, with something like that, use your common sense. It's better to over process something than under process it. So you look at that and you think, okay, I've got mince beef or ground beef and tomatoes. Okay, so look up those two things. How long do I process ground beef or minced beef? How long do I process tomatoes? If, for example, the tomatoes say 45 minutes and the ground beef says 90 minutes, well then obviously you process the combined product for 90 minutes. You go to the higher one, okay? Because as I say, over-processing does no harm. Under-processing, you could be asking for trouble. It's the same with things like um, carrots. Strangely enough, I was surprised, but things like carrots and things like that, um, I think because they're so dense, but they actually have a higher processing time than I would have expected them to have. Um, but that's why it's important that you look those up in your blue canning book and follow the instructions on times and weights and altitudes to the letter and obviously how it affects you and don't forget if you move house I don't care if you've been doing this for 20 years if you move house the game may change if your altitude changes and don't forget if you move you have to look it up and possibly have to relearn from your new site. You might have been doing this for 20 years and suddenly decide you're going to go around and show your girlfriend how this works. But don't forget, your girlfriend will live possibly at a different altitude. So find that information out before you go and make the necessary adjustments. Otherwise you could be poisoning your friend. Sometimes that could be a good thing. But let's just say for the sake of argument, you don't actually want to do it, so we won't. Now, the canning equipment. We will start with the smaller stuff that goes with canning. I think we've covered the jars. As I say, if there's any questions, let me know. Now, this is invaluable certainly saves all the trickling down the side of the jar whenever you're filling it up with well I won't say anything because sometimes I don't use it I must confess if I'm putting pieces of um, uh, potato into into a jar I do that by hand but anything that's liquid based jams anything like that save yourself a lot of hassle and this lot come in a kit form very reasonably priced also available through Oz Farmers. So get yourself a kit. It'll have one of those in it. It'll have one of these, which is um, a little gadget that's got a magnet on the end. Um, when you're canning, and if you watch one of my canning videos, you will see you have to have a bowl. You boil your kettle, and all your lids go into a bowl, and you pour hot water over them, and you let them stand for a few minutes. I think that softens up the seal um, underneath and just makes it ready to, to accept the surface on the jar. Um, but whatever, the things are hard to get out of the hot water. Unless you've got one of these. Because it, it's a magnet. So you can lift a lid out of the, um, the water and put it straight on your jar and with your fingers hold the lid down you lift it straight off wonderful little gadget okay this here a prodder I know you might want to call it that uh, is very important again you'll see when you watch canning videos um, things like um, jams and stocks it's not an issue um, but for example if you're if you're putting uh, mince or ground meat in, into a jar um, you don't want 
air in, in amongst the, the contents down the bottom. Um, you're required to leave a certain amount of space at the top, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if you leave air in the bottom, before you know it, um, in the processing, all the air comes to the surface and you end up with half a jar of air, um, which you don't want. So as you're filling it up, you use this to, to jam it all down um, and to make sure it's in there. Now, the space I mentioned at the top, they call that the head space. You'll read about that in the blue canning book. It's called the head space and it's basically the distance between the top of the contents and the top of the jar. A general rule, most uh, canning requires a one inch head space. Sometimes it's half. Um, with liquids, um, you can get away with less. Um, now, this measures, it's actually written, you see it's a step there. Um, it's actually written on there uh, how many, you know, quarter, half, three quarter inch um, segments. But if you, if you can imagine, you stand that on the inside of the jar, okay, it'll show you where one inch is. If it's a half inch headspace, you go to the half inch mark and it'll show you where half inch is. And that's what that does, and it's great. Um, I had to get this from another preserving company, Vacola, um, and I use that a lot. Actually, it's very handy for the poking down. I find it easier to use, to be honest, than the ball canning. You might find a chopstick or something in your in your utensil drawer that you find easier doesn't matter as long as it gets the air bubbles out of the, the bottom of the jar that's all I'm worried about and the best invention of the lot these this is a jar grabber now imagine our canner is sitting on the stove starting to bubble and I've just poured um, well, for example hot jam into that jar there how do I get it from there to there without using a tea towel and burning myself and getting the tea towel wet? And so I use these and it picks up the jar and I put it in. And likewise, when this is finished, and you will see when you watch me canning, um, quite often the contents when it comes out is still bubbling inside the jar because it's so hot. And I'm, you're standing there holding it and there's all bubbles coming up. It's fascinating. But you need this to be able to get it out of the jar. Um, now these are your Rolls-Royce model because they're spring-loaded and they reopen. Um, there is a set, I haven't got it here actually, but it comes with the ball canning kit. Um, but it's not spring-loaded. Um, but look, it's just as easy to use. Um, I was happily using it until my mother found these and bought them for me. And being on the lazy side, I thought, what a wonderful thing. So I use those in preference. But the other ones, still very, very good. Okay. Now, moving this lot out of the way. The canner itself. Okay. There are different canners around. The only one I've found so far in Australia is the Presto canner. Um, I know a lot of my um, fellow YouTubers and online friends in the US and Canada use the Presto. I'm super happy with the Presto uh, to the point where we've actually bought two. And that's purely and simply because sometimes we, we just can't keep up. And, um, you know, the canner, you're sitting waiting for it to cool and you've got another, you know, 20 pints that are sitting waiting to go in. So we just start another canner up. So, but it also means if something goes wrong with one at a critical time, we've got a backup because here in Australia, it could take weeks to get one. Now, the main body of the canner, hang on, take that out. Okay, the main body of the canner is it's like an immense 
stop hot really. A um, couple of times these have started, to, oh here it goes, started to wiggle. Okay, um, there is a, a screw in there. Just when it does that, make sure you tighten it up straight away so that you don't you don't uh, damage anything, it doesn't wear wear anything out, keeps it nice and tight. Also because of you know the temperature of the contents, you don't you want it nice and tight, you don't want it falling over or going funny. This here, this is the tray that goes inside it. Um, this prevents the jars from um, sitting on the bottom of the canner. Now when you buy your Presto canner, it comes with that. Um, you can buy extra ones uh, as spare parts. Also from Oz Farmers, you can do that. This is not a sponsored video, by the way. Hint, hint, Oz Farmers. Um, but what I do when I get a canner is I get a second rack because when you're dealing with pints and the half pints, um, once you've got 10 in there, you can put the next rack in and put another layer on. And so you can actually get 20 pints in here um, to process all in one hit, uh, which is huge time saver. Uh, and for the sake of, you know, a few few shekels for your for your other rack, it's it's really worth it. We've used it many times. Um, so that's your the basic one. I mean, obviously, um, it is going to stain to a certain extent, but try and keep it clean. Um, there, uh, when you when you process uh, the jars, you put vinegar in, and the vinegar in the water, and the vinegar stops the outside of the jars going cloudy. Um, but it does discolour the inside of the can which is the downside. Um, also, there's a certain amount of seepage comes through. You can imagine um, heating the contents of that up um, to some astronomical amount. Um, a certain amount seeps past the seal into the canner. And you quite often, when you've taken your jars out, um, the water will be cloudy, there'll be a fine grease layer or something on the top of the water and so you know you have to treat it the same as as you do a saucepan if it's been used you clean it don't put it through the dishwasher dishwashers and aluminium in my opinion don't mix um, and if you look after this um, it should last you um, for many years in fact if you look after it, it should outlast you. The other thing you have to check when you clean it, I don't know if you can see, is there's a little bit of a, a lip thing here at the back. Okay, you need to make sure that that is in position. Right, and in a minute when I show you the lid, I'll show you why. So that's the main body of the canner dealt with. Okay. Now, this is the lid. Alright, now we have our pressure gauge in the front. This is our venting, uh, steam escape vent here. There's a black rubber button, if you like, in the front. Um, now that is especially designed, the pressure becomes too much. It will actually blow that out of the lid. Um, obviously make a hell of a noise, scared of death, but it releases all the steam and stops the whole thing exploding, which I personally see as a plus. But make sure that that it's in, you know, in properly. Um, with, your, with your venting thing, hold it up to a light, hold it up to the window, and make sure that you can see straight through it so there's nothing obstructing the hole. Now at the back, I don't know if you can see that thing jiggling up and down. That's called, that's a locking device. And if you see on the inside, what it does is once the lid's fitted in place, 
This part goes underneath that hooky bit on the back of the main body I was telling you about. And what it does is when the thing comes under pressure, it lifts up. Right? And once it lifts up, that thing can't get past it. So in fact locks the lid, so you can't accidentally open it while this is in the up position. And as I say, it remains in the up position while it's under pressure. So, you have to make sure that that is free moving. The other thing is our seal. It has a rubber seal. Now, every time you use it, it needs to be inspected. Okay, it's different if you're using it over and over and over again because you're busy. But when you've finished using it, even if it's just for a few weeks, you get some Vaseline, rub it between your fingers, just a fine amount, and then you work it round, rub it round, and it helps preserve it and it stops it jamming um, onto the, the counter. And it very easily just goes back into the lid and then that's that. Now when you want to put it on the body, okay, this handle here has an arrow on it and the lid has an arrow there. Just there. So you simply line up the arrows and it drops on and you twist. That's why that has to be tightened up, because see how it messes with it. But you twist. And that's it. That lid's not coming off until you untwist. So, anyone who's frightened of them, please don't be. There is nothing to be frightened of. Now, I think that just about brings this to an end you'll find that it's a fun process is a real sense of satisfaction into walking walking into your pantry and finding rows and rows and rows of produce that not only that you you've preserved that you know everything that's in there and so you know when you feed yourself and your family what you're giving them but the fact that a certain amount of it in many cases, in the case of very lucky people, they can say everything that went in there, they grew themselves. I think it's wonderful. And as I say, I think if, if the canning bug bites you, um, look out. Um, here at Hilltop we have our regular pantry, which has you know our tea and coffee and day-to-day -day stuff in it. Um, and anything that's open, open packets and things that we're using, canisters with sugar and flour, and all that's in our regular pantry. But then we have what we call our extended pantry. And extended pantry is any anything that's not been opened, basically. But that's where all the canned goods go. Because when they get open, they either get used, or if you only use part of it, you put the rest in the fridge. One day I'll, I'll do a special on um, on the extended pantry and how you audit and keep notes of what you've got. Um, ours is in a certain amount of disarray at the moment, so I won't bore you with that. But um, when it's like that, it's actually hard uh, to keep track of what you've got, what you haven't got. Even just setting up um, for you today. I've learnt of two or three things that we are actually out of that I wasn't aware of, um, just because of the way uh, we've got it set out, so we're going to have to rejig that. Um, and when when we do that, we'll take you along for the ride and, and show you how we're going to monitor it in future. Um, but yes, as I say, if you have any questions at all, um, put them in the comments or go click on the uh, go into our channels page, click on about and the email address for Hilltop Farm is in there, you can email me directly. Um, I'm Jay 
and I think that's about that's about it. Thank you for um, putting up with me. I probably bored you half to death, um, but it's been fun, and I'm really pleased to be able to share this uh, this important part of our of our kitchen with you and our and our uh, homesteading journey with you. So it's goodbye from Hilltop Farm. See you later.